Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today I'm going to try to fix this Marshall 15 watt guitar amp that developed this problem. This is a late 1990s or early 2000s, not quite sure, Marshall G15R CD guitar amplifier that I've been using for some years to practice guitar playing. And as you heard in the introduction, this developed quite some hum, so it's barely usable at this point. This is not the top of the line Marshall stuff, this is just meant to be a hobbyist practice amp, which I used this for. Uh, interestingly, these were, when they were released, they actually came as Park amps. Park is kind of like what Squire is for Fender guitars for Marshall. They were the bottom of the line product, still produced, designed by Marshall. They outsourced production to countries that had lower wages, so they could market them at lower prices. They are not particularly good, but they are quite decent sounding and this got some very favorable reviews, so it's not a bad amp, just not in its current state. So I'm going to try to uh, fix the hum that this has, which barely makes the guitar signal audible over the hum, so it's pretty much unusable at this point. Nothing much to lose, not a very expensive amp, still worth fixing because it doesn't sound bad. So let's take it apart and have a look inside. Let me take a couple of seconds to thank the sponsor for this video, PCBWay, my favorite manufacturer of prototype circuit boards. They also offer CNC machining, 3D printing and other services, all of which are of very high quality. So I highly recommend checking them out. Check out the link in the video description if you are interested. Back to the amplifier. Usually the way you take these apart is there's screws on the top that you have to take out and then you can take this whole portion, slide this whole thing out which contains the electronics and the amplifier. The rest of it is just the speaker that is connected through some spade connectors here. As you can probably see, this is a 15 watts amp so it's not hilariously loud, it's still plenty for your living room and uh, for annoying the neighbors. <laughs> Let's get these screws out here. Take out the whole amplifier. This is not a, a valve amp or a tube amp. Those are the way more expensive models that supposedly sound a bit smoother. But this is not bad for a transistor amp that it is. It's still a Marshall and they're not going to sell you complete crap under that brand, <clears throat> I guess. The mains cable is screwed in with a little clip here. So that should come out. I'm going to unplug the speaker as well. Now we should be able to take this whole thing out here. There we go. So here's what's in here. Not much going on at all. We have a transformer that is uh, directly connected to the mains. There is a fuse, obviously, and then we have our power supply section with a tiny little bridge rectifier, filtering capacitors to smooth out the voltages, and we have our main amplification circuit here. I think that's probably the main amplifier. And we have these amplifier chips, which are KIA4558, eight, three of them. And then we have a couple of resistors and capacitors and some diodes. And I think that some of these diodes are used to actually provide the distortion, fuzz, overdrive, whatever you want to call it, that uh, makes this sound like a guitar amplifier. These chips are actually aimed at hi-fi stuff, so they are not really offering any distortion or anything like that. They are just audio amps of the hi-fi kind, which is pretty interesting. Nothing too special about this, but there is a real spring reverb module in here. There's actual springs in there that are actually fat the audio signal and then they vibrate and create a springy reverb sound, which is a classical feature of guitar amps. The rest of it, not so classic, just a regular 
1990s or maybe early 2000s audio amplifier, uh, except for those diodes. Let's take a look at our circuit diagram, which I printed out here. I'm also going to link that in the video description. I'm going to go through this roughly as far as I understand it and explain some things to you. So we have our mains input here. This is our mains voltage. We have a switch. We have a class Y capacitor filtering the noise coming back from the device to the grid, usually also filtering some of the high frequency noise from the mains going to the device. We have our mains transformer, which uh, has the primary winding here connected to the mains. And we have two 16 volt windings here and a center winding that is connected to ground and that goes to our LED which is actually separately wired up in parallel to the rest of the circuit which is kind of a nice feature. The AC voltage coming from the transformer is rectified with this one N4004 diode so the LED doesn't see reverse polarity basically. It's still going to flicker a bit, which isn't really a big issue. But yeah, this is basically directly hooked up to the transformer, to the secondary, which is kind of interesting. Probably to not interfere with the rest of the circuit. Then we have a bridge rectifier and our two mains filter capacitors. And as you can see here, the voltages are divided into a positive rail and a negative rail. Uh, that are then smoothed out by these capacitors. There are Zener diodes that are used for voltage regulation. So we have one 9.1 positive rail and 9.1 volts negative rail, which are then used by these BA4558 amplifier ICs. There's actually three of them in the amplifier. And these are used as differential amps. So they use a center voltage, which is usually connected to ground, which is highly important in this case. And then they use minus 9.1 volts and plus 9.1 volts and amplify both halves of a wave that go into them separately. Basically, these chips are used for all the different modules. Uh, this one is used to amplify the signal for the reverb module, it says here. There's our reverb potentiometer. Then we have on top here our volume controls, the normal volume control, and we have our boost gain circuit, which actually has these two diodes here, uh, two standard 1N4148 diodes. These are actually used to provide some kind of uh, fuzz, crunch, distortion, overdrive. Th this is what makes this whole thing, which is otherwise mostly a hi-fi amp, this is what makes this sound like a guitar amp. Uh, these diodes are used to clip the signal and add kind of overtones and distortion. Yeah, you can basically use the two gain potentiometers to saturate these and make them clip in weird ways. This is actually a similar circuit used in common distortion pedals and probably you could replace these diodes with something else and make the amp sound completely different, which is something I might look into in the future. Some modders even replaced this with actual LEDs because they clip at an earlier lower voltage, which uh, makes distortion pedals, for example, uh, distort more or in funkier ways. Yeah, then we have our tone circuit. There's a contour potentiometer which is used as the mid frequencies potentiometer. We have bass and treble and then we have another IC that amplifies the signal for this. And we have our master volume potentiometer and that again goes into this uh, chip which is the pre-amplifier for our power amp section, which has uh, an LM1875, which is a 20 watts audio amplifier, like standard audio amplifier. These are pretty beefy, actually. That's the one connected to the heatsink. And that is our main power amplifier that goes through some filtering again. And it also uses a differential amplification, 
with the minus PA and plus PA voltages and it basically goes straight to our speaker. And we have a headphone output which is like in most audio amplification circuits is just the main amplifier hooked up through some resistors that output a lowered down signal for the headphones. And we have a line out that again is a slightly lowered volume signal which is also hooked up to the mains amplifier. And that's basically how this works. There's actually been quite some changes to this in the late 90s, 96. Probably this was when this was designed and later in the year they changed some things like small things. Some calls were added, some capacitors. Capacitor got deleted, they changed some other caps in 98 and they changed a resistor value and another cap. This is quite interesting to see all that on here. And they seem to have used fax machines back in the day, as some people still do, especially here in Germany. I can't understand. And as the hum that we heard is a 100 hertz mains hum, basically, you are going to hear different hum frequencies for different mains frequencies. So we have 50 hertz mains frequency here in Germany that results usually after a uh, bridge rectification and things like that in an audible 100 hertz hum which we heard in the intro in regions that have 60 hertz mains frequency you are obviously going to hear a 120 hertz hum i'm suspecting that something's wrong with the power supply section because the hum clearly is a mains hum Maybe our bridge rectifier is broken but the first thing that i suspect might be broken are the filter capacitors that are supposedly filtering out all the rest of the mains fluctuations. So I am going to take this whole board out and replace the capacitors as my first step, I think. Also, these are not, I don't think these are good caps. No, they are Sam Samson brand. <laughs> So these are not the best caps. Uh, they are Samps Samson, Samson brand uh, capacitors, which I've come across quite a few that were leaky or dried up. And as this is a 90s device or early 2000s device, uh, chances are that these capacitors have just gone bad in some way or the other. So. Yeah, let's take the circuit board out and replace the capacitors as a first step. I think we have to get all these knobs off. I think we also have to unscrew all of these audio jacks to get the circuit board out because all the components are soldered to the circuit board. We also have to remove these screws. Yeah, that's going to be the most fun. So let's get the knobs off, which just should pull off ideally. That one is super stubborn. Okay. All the knobs and screws are off. Now for the screws on the heat sink. I think I'm going to take these off and then there's nothing else holding this in place and we can just take this whole thing out. They actually took some care that has some lock rings and some spring rings in there. That's pretty nice because this whole device is going to shake because it has a speaker mounted right under it. And you don't want your screws to wiggle themselves loose. So it is uh, not completely badly made. It's uh, very well made actually. The circuit is nothing special, but the whole construction of it is pretty good. I don't mind that at all. So probably we can pull this whole thing out here. Some wiggling. There we are. Yeah, I think we might even be able to work on it like this. I'm going to clip some of these uh, cable ties here. We don't have to unplug much of the circuit. We can always put some cable ties back. Yeah, we're going to unplug the mains plug here. 
the spade connectors from the mains switch. I decided to desolder these speaker wires, which are labeled on the circuit board as red and black. I'm going to desolder those and we should have enough room with the cables, the other cables still attached to work on this circuit board. And this is a single-sided circuit board, so it's not particularly difficult to work on this at all. Now we have enough room to work on this, I think. I'm going to replace all the electrolytic capacitors on this board. Probably it's not really necessary to remove the smaller ones, but uh, as these are from the 90s or early 2000s, probably a good idea because these components age. I'm going to replace them with some good Panasonic FC series capacitors that are aimed at being used in audio applications. I love these because they are 105 degrees Celsius rated, pretty long life capacitors, general purpose stuff, especially for older equipment or audio equipment. I really like these for everything and they never really failed me. So yeah, Panasonic FC is what's going to go in here. I'm just going to go one by one so I don't get the polarity confused. These have polarity markings on them. I think the polarity is also marked on the board. There's little plus signs everywhere where the positive side of the capacitor goes. The positive side is usually the one that is not marked on the capacitor. So this stripe you can see on the side here, there's also a minus sign on the stripe. That usually is the uh, negative side. I'm just going to go with the same capacitance rating, so the microfarad rating and the same voltage rating or slightly higher voltage rating as usual. I'm just going to replace all the capacitors now. These are glued down with hot glue. <laughs> Usually you can use some alcohol to free the hot glue. have all the old electrolytic capacitors out and put new ones in. I'm going to put a list of these capacitors that are removed in the video description in case you want to do the same stuff so you have it easier to find the parts. Let's take a look at how bad these capacitors really are. I got out my Peak Atlas ESR Plus, which is a fancy capacitance and ESR meter. And I also have this table of uh, some typical ESR values of capacitors of certain capacitance and voltage ratings. Uh, these are always to be taken with a grain of salt because a capacitor specs vary wildly. So uh, these are not representative necessarily of these exact capacitors. In theory it would be necessary to have a datasheet for these capacitors which I didn't find. It's pro probably impossible to find these. I'm not sure. Yeah these tables are just general purpose tables. They vary. There are different kinds of tables of these around so the values are just not very accurate. Uh, unless you have the exact data sheet for the capacitors you're measuring and you can see the ratings that these are supposed to have. I'm still going to do this and as you can see we have the full capacitance. These are supposed to be 2200. This is even a bit more. The ESR is at 0.47 ohms. Let's see, 2200, 16 volts is supposed to have 0.08 ohms, so that is way high. Let's measure the other one. These are the big filter capacitors uh, from the power supply section. Yeah, that's even higher ESR. Capacitance is a bit low, so this one 
is marginal, the other one was marginal as well. I think uh, probably these are all still kind of in spec. This is 100 microfarad one at 63.93. That's a bit over ESR wise, but not much. So these are probably good. I think the filter capacitors are what really caused the hum. This is uh, 100 microfarads, 63 volts. This is also low on capacitance and a bit high on ESR. That's usually an indication for these caps slowly going bad. The capacitance decreases. Uh, this is supposed to be 47 microfarads, 47 microfarads, 25 volts, 2.9 ohms. That's lower than expected. So this one is probably good. Uh, they have large tolerances in general. So uh, they are probably all still in spec, but marginal and especially the large 2200 microfarad caps were a bit marginal. So probably a good idea that I replaced them. And there's my new capacitors in place. I didn't have FC series ones for every single cap, but most of them are FC series. I'm going to add some new hot glue to these because these are not supposed to rattle around and wiggle them th themselves loose when the amplifier is in use. So I glued these two together and uh, also attached them to the circuit board with some hot glue. Uh, while I'm in here, I'm also going to remove this screw here and put some new heatsink plaster on this transistor here or this amplifier. There's a little plastic ring to insulate this from the heatsink. You want to make sure that that goes back on, I guess. So I'm removing this whole old crumbly mess with some alcohol and a Q-tip. And then I'm going to put some new stuff on there. Oh, and now with the grease removed, or most of it, it actually became apparent that this is insulated from the heatsink. So this uh, top metal part is insulated with this sheet that's glued on here. This is just a little mylar sheet that uh, goes between the heatsink and the transistor amplifier chip. And that gets some heatsink grease as well. So in order to connect it to the heatsink and the chip. Yeah, it turned out quite same amount of mess that it was, but at least it's new thermal paste. Now it looks uh, just as shoddy, but is going to work better. <laughs> I am quickly going to double check if this makes the connection to the heatsink, which it shouldn't. So this should be completely isolated from this, which it is. And the screw is obviously connected to the heatsink, but the tab on our chip isn't nice. I think I'm going to put this back in here and temporarily screw it down without putting all the screws back in to test this. Oh, we have to put the speaker wires back in. And I'm obviously going to clean the whole circuit board with some IPA from the back side here. And these are reconnected. So this is going to be cleaner than ever before. I'm also screwing the whole heatsink assembly back in because that is a, a grounding point as well. So with all the capacitors replaced, chances are that this is just going to not hum anymore. So I'm going to temporarily put it back into the enclosure and hook it up to the speaker and see what we get. There's a minus and a plus sign on the speaker. The red wire goes to the plus sign and the black wire goes to the minus. So let's see if we still get that annoying amount of hum from this or if it blows up maybe. We're going to find out shortly. Much less hum.
that is way more like it. Still get a bit of hum, but only if we push the master volume way up. So that's, that's uh, how it's supposed to work, actually. We get a bit of crackle from the potentiometers, but it's not humming to an extent that is super annoying. That's good. The last step is going to be spraying some contact cleaner into these openings on the potentiometers and working them for a bit. This is a Teslanol T6 that I use all the time, which works very well on potentiometers. And I'm just spraying some in there and then working all the pots for a little while. And then it's time to put everything back together, basically. So we're going to put all the nuts back on here. Cleaning them a bit before that, while we're here. There we go. And now it's just a matter of putting all the knobs back on. And I'm going to try to make sure that they point to the zero while these are turned all the way down. Yep. Ta-da! And with everything back together, It still hums about the same as before. <laughs> so it's somewhat better. You can probably hear by the signal to noise ratio and it doesn't hum that much. I think there's still something wrong with it. Because if I touch these screws, the hum gets less. So probably there's some kind of ground fault in here as well. So I'm going to have to go, go back in. But it's a whole lot better already. <clears throat> I took the whole thing apart again and I realized uh, that I might just have made a rookie mistake. You might be able to see this green wire here with the spade connector. And that is actually the ground connection, the audio ground connection for the whole amplifier circuit <clears throat> and that supposedly I think goes on this lock here so the earth mains earth is actually connected to the audio circuitry through the uh, chassis of the amplifier that might explain the remaining hum that we got the hum got a lot better with the new capacitors so they definitely were worth replacing but this might just fix the whole thing. <laughs> I'm not even sure if this was uh, connected when I first took this apart. And we're going to see if that makes a good connection. Sometimes it's the small things. That might just be the remaining issue here. So a uh, multimeter set to continuity testing and this should be ground on our... Yeah, and that is connected through now which is how it's supposed to be. And this is a separate ground here. So, yeah. Basically, our audio ground is connected to mains earth. So all the connections going out there, as it's supposed to be, are connected to mains earth. This sure belongs there. <laughs> Let's see if that fixed it. I'm going to put this back together and test it again. Let's see. Ah. Uh, no hum if I turn up the master volume all the way. Absolutely no hum. So that was the fault, the remaining one. The capacitors were pretty worn out and the ground lock was not in place. I'm also going to put some cable ties in here because this needs sh some shake proofing. I like to use these neon pink ones. Uh, just in case I don't remember I was in here. This way, I'm definitely going to remember I was in here. <laughs> yeah, same procedure as before. I'm putting all the, all the nuts back on. Not going to show you this again, because you already saw me doing that. 
and I have to do it again because I was uh, impatient and didn't pay attention to the grounding. So it's all back together and this is actually what it's supposed to do when I turn it on. Very little hum. Now it works again. That was kind of a journey. By the way, you want to tell if an amplifier has a real spring reverb, you turn up the spring reverb and you can hear the springs when you hit it. <laughs> Just as an aside. Yeah, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope it was informative. Maybe you managed to fix your Marshall amp. They are all very much the same internally. I think the little ones except for the ones that have like shaping electronics in there. But the amplifier section should pretty much be the same. And the power supply section, which was the issue here, is also the same. Electrolytic capacitors that are more than 20 years old, like in this one, always good idea to replace those because they have a limited lifespan and they're going to dry up and uh, not work as intended anymore. Worst case, you even get them shorting out and destroying your amplifier. And the grounding problem, yeah. Basically, uh, make sure that all the ground connections are where they are supposed to be. Hey. Yeah, I hope to see you on this channel again. Usually I do retro computing stuff and other electronics, but from time to time I tinker with audio stuff as well because I enjoy it. Hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon and the YouTube channel memberships page and on Ko-fi and on PayPal and elsewhere. Thanks for your comments, your subscriptions and also your thumbs. I'm Jan Beta. See you next time. Bye.